Well, good morning to those of you who are in Paris. Good afternoon for those in Singapore or Taipei. And good evening for those further away, in particular in uh, Sydney, Canberra. I can't remember where you are wrong, but in Australia somewhere. So uh, yesterday we discussed the impact of technology on domestic politics in East Asia. And today we'll be discussing the role and impact of technology on the economic sphere. So it's a, it's a well-known fact that technology is a key driver of economic growth. But more importantly today, perhaps, technology is also a key pillar of economic <clears throat> power, uh, given the high technology content of many products. As a result, getting a technological edge gives a country a huge advantage over its competitors or even rivals. The Sino-US rivalry, of course, is a case in point, and uh, everybody agrees that the trade war between the two powers is actually more about technological supremacy than about trade per se. This leads uh, governments to intervene and to behave in a more, perhaps what can be called mercantilist manner. A country's technological capabilities are connected in particular to national security, making technology a, an extremely sensitive uh, issue. So this is the kind of issue that we'll be discussing in the next hour or so. And for that, we have uh, we are very fortunate, I think, to have three uh, excellent panelists whom I will introduce uh, now. And uh, we'll introduce them by the order of appearance on, on stage or on screen. So let me start with uh, Alexander Capri, who is currently a research fellow at the Heinrich Foundation and senior fellow and lecturer in the business school at the National University of Singapore. And he's also a lecturer in the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the same uh, National University of Singapore. Alex has over 20 years of experience in value chains, logistics, and global trade management, uh, both as an academic and a professional consultant, which makes his expertise particularly uh, precious. He has published extensively on global value chains, trade and geopolitics, as well as global tech, the digital economy, and the industries of the future. So I think we couldn't hope to have a better panelist to open the discussion on the impact of technology on East Asian economies. Second in line is Clara Gillespie, who is currently an international visiting fellow at the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy and senior advisor to the National Bureau of Asian Research in uh, Washington, D.C., working on trade, economy, and energy affairs. Clara uh, graduated from the LSC and Peking University, as well as Georgetown University and University of Tokyo. Clara has worked extensively on South Korea, and her research covers topics ranging from technology policymaking to geopolitical trends in the Asia Pacific, also making her a perfect candidate for participating in this uh, panel. Uh, finally, last but not least, Wang Le Tu is a senior analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASP where her research covers Asian regional security, China-US competition foreign policy, and Southeast Asia with a focus on Vietnam. Uh, prior to moving down under, uh, Wong was an associate fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, and a non-resident fellow at the Institute of International Relations at the National Chengchi University in Taiwan, where she obtained her PhD. She has also held uh, short-term research positions in several Southeast Asian countries, including Malaysia and Indonesia. She's worked and lived in KL, Jakarta, Seoul, among others. So she will be providing the perspective from Southeast Asia in the panel. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Alex for uh, what I would call some kind of uh, introductory presentation, setting the stage for the discussion, explaining exactly what the issues are, uh, explaining us what he means with uh, techno-nationalism, the way this techno-nationalism plays out in, in East Asia, what are the instruments, the objectives, uh, etc. Well, I don't want to preempt what he's going to say. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I give you the floor for a maximum 12 minutes, if that's possible, so that it leaves some space, enough space for discussion eventually. So Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francoise, and uh, hello to everyone and uh, distinguished panelists. Um, 
let's talk about uh, the the overarching geopolitical uh, scenario that we're looking at today um, as we discuss these technology issues and this you know we can call it a technology cold war or a hybrid cold war um, I prefer to call it techno nationalism because it's it's an issue that's enmeshed in um, a number of other issues that have been fragmenting uh, global value chains that have been pushing global value chains towards more localization and regionalization. Uh, and, and so we'll keep it in that context. Um, so, so the US-China, um, let, let's call it a, a, a geopolitical rivalry, um, is not a trade war. Um, trade is but one swim lane. It's but one aspect of, an, of a more broad overarching uh, geopolitical rivalry. Um, as Francoise mentioned, technology um, from, from a nationalist perspective and techno-nationalism is about how uh, a nation state uh, looks at technology as it pertains to national security, um, as it pertains to the economic strength and competitiveness of its of its core industries, its of its competitive advantages, uh, and now I think more and more because of the ubiquitous nature of data uh, and the digital economy, the platform economy, techno nationalism is um, more and more oriented towards social issues, social stability issues, uh, and values. So political values, and I'll come back to that. So again, national security, economics, and, and social issues. Now this pertains to um, hard technologies, things like semiconductors uh, and other strategic technologies, for example, 5G, wireless, essentially the fourth industrial revolution. Anything that's going to pertain to the internet of things, to AI, to robotics, machine learning, um, you know, any of these things which then confer a techno-nationalist advantage are going to be at the center of this issue. So it's hard technologies, and now it's increasingly data as a strategic asset. And then when we look at the application of technologies, um, how do those technologies either um, suppress or support specific values. And the values in particular would be privacy, which is linked, of course, to di very distinct political values, uh, ideological values. So does technology either suppress privacy or does it protect privacy? Surveillance um, does, again, the same issue. Does it, does it uh, put more people under surveillance or you know, is it used for autocratic purposes. Um, and then finally, censorship, freedom of expression. How is technology being used by a nation state or by an, by a, by an ecosystem of technology that, that may in fact be a model of a particular um, system? Um, how, is that, how is that technology being used to either suppress or to promote those three values? So again, those are big issues today, and of course, if we look at the um, the sanctions uh, that the United States, in particular, has been leveling against um, companies, individuals, or even entire countries, more and more we're seeing that those export controls, companies being placed on restricted entity lists, are somehow running afoul of those different standards when it comes to the application of technology. So that's a really big issue. So when we look at Huawei um, and, and the, the US and its allies, um, essentially um, you know, joining, joining links and you know, coming up with things like the Clean Network uh, Initiative, where essentially the, that initiative is is set to expunge Chinese technology from telecommunications systems and platforms and, and even apps um, around the world. So what we're seeing then as a result of this techno-nationalism is strategic decoupling, 
And I use the term strategic, um, you know, with emphasis, uh, because it, it, you know, where we have these these sensitive technologies again that 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 apply to the areas that we just discussed, there will be decoupling, absolutely. And if there's going to be decoupling, there will be some reshoring of strategic industries, and and uh, one sector in particular uh, will be semiconductors. Um, and in, in the case of reshoring, we will see more manufacturing uh, returning to the United States. We'll possibly see and we'll probably see the beginnings of value chains and manufacturing in Europe um, and in other uh, ring-fenced markets. So, so we'll see decoupling, reshoring, and ring-fencing of strategic industries, both from a hard technology standpoint and if necessary, regarding um, data, the ring fencing of data, the ring fencing of, of platforms, of digital platforms. Um, and that, of course, will enhance this phenomenon of fragmentation that, that was already occurring because of the application of new technologies, where as new technologies emerge, robotics, in particular applications of AI, um, it just made more economic sense, and it makes more economic sense to produce as close to a market as possible and not necessarily have to have uh, a fully rationalized, completely internationalized, unbundled um, value chain uh, that spreads around the world if you can compress it and, and localize it. So we're going to see that accelerate. COVID-19 um, has accelerated that trend. Uh, and and I, I expect we'll see that we'll see that continue as well. Um, so what does this mean? So we're going to see uh, for what does this mean for Southeast Asia, for example? What does this mean for distinct regions of the world? Um, I would argue that when it comes to the emergence of coalitions of the willing, these are countries that share the same values. Um, multilateral arrangements that promote um, values around trade, around cross-border uh, commerce, um, we will continue to see a fragmentation um, where you will have like-minded groups of, of countries um, coalescing around different value systems. And we're already seeing that um, with the United States and the European Union, despite significant differences when it comes to um, data, uh, the big digital um, companies, when it comes to antitrust issues, privacy issues, despite those differences between you know, the, the Europeans and the North Americans, um, we're seeing a reorientation or a recalibration around innovation, around AI ethics, um, around public-private partnerships. Um, so I expect to see um, an increase, an emergence of new public-private partnerships that, um, that again, support these different um, value blocks uh, around the values that I've just discussed. And I think now with a Biden presidency, um, you know, where he's, he's, he's come out, you know, President-elect Biden has, has come out and said, we are going to spend... $700 billion on the reshoring of industry, uh, strategic industries into the United States. But a lot of that is going to be R&D. It's going to be digital infrastructure. Um, it's going to be upgrading. Um, uh, it's going to be a research and development. So, so I think this, com this competition between the United States and China, but really China versus the world's liberal democracies, um, sort of a, a techno-authoritarian model versus a digital democracy model, um, I think we will see, frankly, another moonshot uh, when it comes to innovation mercantilism. Um, and and, and you know, I, ref I refer to the term moonshot uh, in, in the context of the, the previous Cold War between the United States and the former Soviet Union, where there was a space race uh, and, and and that space race was a technology race, which uh, which which then turned into this this moonshot event, which was decades of investment um, in the United States um, uh, towards you know getting to the moon essentially. Uh, and I'm just approaching ten minutes, so I'm going to start winding down here. Um, so so 
what does this mean? There are some contradictions. If we're going to see ring fencing as strategic reshoring uh, and decoupling, that means that we're going to see increases in investment, paradoxically, into these ring fence markets. So you will see in China for China um, strategies or in India for India and in Europe and US and so on. That's going to mean as companies diversify their, their, their value chains that um, they are actually going to have to invest more in local markets because they're going to be losing economies of scale. Um, they're going to be losing that, that transferability of, of data and human capital and, and assets uh, that we've grown accustomed to in the last three decades of globalization. Um, so there are the upside here is that even though we're seeing a restructuring of supply chains, we're seeing all these things that I've just mentioned, some of which is, is negative, um, there are huge capacity building opportunities across Asia, in some of these uh, markets, Vietnam, Malaysia, Australia, Singapore, India, etc. cetera. Um, there will be a lot of capacity building oppor opportunities and um, developmental opportunities and, and so on. So um, I think at 11 minutes and 45 seconds, I will wind things down. Thank you. You're on mute, uh, Francoise. Sorry. Yeah, just one one small thing before I give the floor to to Clara. So what you what you mean to say is that, uh, so to speak, politics will trump economics in a in a way. That is, this economy of scale that we've been uh, seeing over the past decades or so, this will be uh, abandoned, so to speak. There will be more fragmentation, as you as you say, more reshoring, etc. So duplication of production uh, uh, units, so so to speak. So this is in contradiction to the standard economic thinking that we should rationalize and we should you know, simplify things and uh, fragment, but in, in another way, the production processes as much as we can in order to uh, cut a cost down. So this will be abandoned. That's what, that's what, you, what you argue, right? Well, again, I would say strategically in, in sensitive sectors, yes. And, and in that regard, we are seeing a paradigm shift towards a no, uh, sort of a neo-mercantilist view of the world. Um, in that regard and and sort of a, a shift away from really what was pretty you know it was somewhat of a myth that we've been in a, in a laissez-faire open market trading system that's not been true china has been a mer mercantilist country uh from the day it entered the wto and continues to be um it's just that it's grown so big and its scale is so vast now that um we're seeing we're seeing other countries resorting uh, to neo you know neo mercantilist behavior uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm advocating that uh, but it's it's just it's 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 certainly not something that I believe the, the you know the, the 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 Western markets should look to emulate um, you know but there will there will absolutely be more state activism more state interventionism in markets now because of the situation that we're in okay yeah, thanks. Well, you know, being an economist by by training, I'm kind of shocked at the, hearing this kind of things. You know? <laughs> That's why I was reacting. Okay, well, uh, now I give the floor to Clara to provide us with uh, some kind of a Northeast Asian perspective, so reaction of these countries to this Sino-US rivalry, basically. So, Clara, the floor is yours for uh, 12 minutes. Same thing. Thank you, Francoise. And I'd like to build on the really excellent framework that Alex provided, as you mentioned, to dive right into talking about the three countries in Northeast Asia outside of China that are also trying to shape what we might call this emerging 5G era. And more specifically, that's Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. Now, as of this summer, all three of these countries have officially launched their own commercial 5G networks. Uh, and for at least the next two to three years, we expect them to be among the major centers of deployment globally in terms of overall share and impact. Uh, 
interesting to note is when you look at how 4 to 5G switching has proceeded so far, uh, you've seen very strong early enthusiasm in each of these markets, uh, suggesting that by 2025, they'll have some of the highest 5G penetration globally. Uh, for Japan and for Taiwan, it's going to be about a 50% penetration. Uh, for South Korea, it's actually supposed to reach 70%. Uh, now, I highlight that not just because I like numbers, but because that level of enthusiasm can be a really encouraging signal to firms who are thinking about how they want to position their investment for the next day, uh, decade. If you are taking a risk on building some of these new projects and infrastructure, is there the potential market there? Uh, when we talk about bringing smart cities to scale, smart manufacturing, the digitalization of healthcare, or energy, uh, these can all be very encouraging early indicators. Now, the flip side challenge that we all know quite well for these three economies is that relatively, uh, they have very small domestic populations compared to other parts of the world. So over the next decade, as India, Indonesia, uh, parts of Europe and Southeast Asia launch their own commercial 5G networks, their relative weight as a market unto themselves is inevitably going to diminish. So if you're a firm in one of these countries or let's say a policymaker, the question that you're asking yourself right now is, what is the right series of domestic policies that matches with my own national values and priorities, but also allows me to be competitive in going globally? What's going to allow me to be competitive against some of my rivals in other countries, peer economies, but also ideally to work with the countries that I want to be able to work with? Um, and here there are just three critical factors that I want to touch on that will shape the way forward. First, of course, is that one that's always on our mind. Uh, what's going on with Huawei? How has this uh, impacted these three countries? How are each of these three responding? Uh, now, when the US first announced in 2018 that it would be levying sanctions on Huawei, Japan was actually one of the first countries in the world to respond in kind with its own announcement on how it would restrict uh, Huawei in its 5G network. Now, if you go today to the Huawei network or Huawei website, you'll actually see this little Q&A that says, you know, in fact, Japan has not banned Huawei uh, in its 5G infrastructure. And that's technically accurate. <laughs> what Japan has done today in navigating this is set guidelines in its government procurement uh, that are effectively country and company neutral. But in terms of how they evaluate security conditions, other technical measures, um, it effectively has the same impact as a ban on Huawei. Uh, likewise, Taiwan has also implemented restrictions that push Huawei out of its 5G network infrastructure and other critical systems. Uh, this is not a new policy for Taiwan. It actually carries over what we saw in some of its 4G development as well. Um, but again, it expands it. Um, and it's, I think, good to note here briefly that while we're talking about building new things or kind of new forward-looking ambition, these are not cost-free actions on the part of any of these. I mean, it's not only that you might think about Huawei as the provider who could supply your base stations or other infrastructure. Uh, Huawei is also a buyer of critical products that these countries produce, Taiwan in particular, uh, and. TSMC has had close relations with Huawei in terms of selling of chips and other things. So the loss of that market is a blow that they've had to address in certain ways. And I think it's the fact that TC, uh, TSMC has done that speaks to their accurate belief that um, there is a relationship between the economic and security dimensions of Huawei's risk. Now, South Korea has taken a fairly different stance in multiple fronts. Uh, the Moon administration, government ministries, kind of across the board policymakers have repeatedly emphasized that they are not open to a blanket ban against Huawei uh, and 5G. Yes, they will abide by all sanctions, uh, but they have, in their interpretation, struck a different uh, balance in coming to a calculation on this risk and security assessment. 
Uh, that balance normally breaks down into these terms. Uh, yes, we will restrict Huawei in our intelligence sharing assets or other secure systems such as this, but for more commercial networks, um, we have different technical and policy tools for reducing our actual exposure to risk. And those are both neutral to the firm and something that makes us comfortable with when Huawei can compete, allowing them into those systems. Uh, now we could go into a whole long debate on the validity of that argument, and I suspect that we might in the Q&A. Um, but instead for right now, I just want to point out what's interesting about this debate is given the level of emphasis that the Trump administration in particular has put on the Huawei sanctions question, uh, you might interpret Korea's strong pushback as suggesting that Huawei has a much more significant in the country's uh, significant role in the country's 5G infrastructure than it actually does, um, which is not the case. Um, Korea has three major telecoms, two of which have a majority share, uh, a predominant share of all connections, and neither of those two use Huawei infrastructure. Uh, one does, but even in terms of their actual 5G deployments, uh, the share of Huawei base stations is not that great, um, which might then again lead to the question of what's going on here, why this you know, strong pushback. And that really lends me into the second key factor that I see driving some of these dynamics, which is you know, the points that we've already hit on, on the broader question of U.S.-China trade tensions. And, you know, I'd agree with Alex and others in saying, you know, this is a trade war that's not about trade, uh, but its impacts are not exclusively geopolitical either. Uh, for these three countries in particular, they've had real dollar and cents economic impacts. Um, so in terms of how these three countries are navigating their triangle relationships, their partnerships with both China, or China and the United States. It's been a challenging question. Uh, both Japan and South Korea are formal treaty allies with the United States. Uh, Taiwan and the United States relations are bound by the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, and that's been a really positive foundation that over the past four decades now has led to deepening economic as well as military ties. Uh, but in all of these cases, China has now surpassed the United States as their most significant trading partner. Um, and that's really where you see, for example, in the case of Korea, uh, deepening partnerships between Korean firms and not just Huawei and third markets, uh, but other Chinese firms as well uh, on smart cities and other efforts. Um, and this is something that is not necessarily a bad thing to say that you have, you know, this distinction between your trading partner and your economic, but it is also accurate to say that we've seen over the past decade a number of times in which China is willing or is open to using this economic leverage coercively. Uh, we've seen it in the China-Japan relationship when it comes to critical minerals and other assets cutting off. Um, We've also seen it in the China-Korea uh, relationship, particularly in some of the uh, boycotts after uh, the THAAD exercises that really hit Latte and other companies. Um, this last point might raise the question, well, so again, but why has Korea not necessarily pivoted closer to the United States in this? Again, why this pushback? Um, I think there is, especially in Korea sometimes, a real question about the extent to which the United States and others are an advocate for the interest, how that plays out, what are the methods for reinsurement? Um, it's an interesting challenge and open question. But I think even if you set aside the specific security concerns with China in particular or policy questions such as its uh, surveillance and censorship regimes, there's also the question that each of these three countries is asking, which is how healthy is it to have the level of overall reliance on one economy that they currently do. So that's really led to an emphasis on, yes, because of China, but also because of this reliance, how do we support diversification? Um, each of these three countries notably has their own version of an Indo-Pacific strategy uh, that looks at Southeast Asia, not only as the you know, growth market that they want to target in 5G and elsewhere, uh, but also a potentially important partner across the board on multiple things. Um, and as Alex mentioned, it's both an outward looking strategy, but there are also questions about shoring up best practices at home. What is the opportunity to think about the disruption of the current moment 
as an opportunity uh, for reshoring, for encouraging your own firms to return from overseas. Japan has looked at this in particular with its investment practices, um, as well as highlighting the work that they have done over the last decade to improve their own market fundamentals. Uh, Taiwan in particular has been highlighting this as a way to bring in more overseas industries, uh, Microsoft in particular expanding their operations here. Third and finally, and I know I'm running up against time, so I'll keep this short. I, I want to end with just saying that as we think about these factors going forward, uh, the tensions and the questions that they're facing are not just about the US-China relationship and how that influences it. Um, there are also questions about their trading relations with themselves. And we could have a whole separate conversation on Japan-Korea tensions and trade and how that's influenced techno-nationalism concerns. But they're also not only external. Um, each of these three countries is also facing some fairly existential questions about how to move forward. Uh, they've been very successful to debate in scaling up 5G. The question is now how you go from that into deploying specific products, new services. Um, and I, I won't go into this, but I'll just throw out some ideas that we might discuss in the break. <laughs> but for each of these three, um, you can see some very interesting debates going on domestically about data protection and privacy that are not just about how foreign countries or foreign actors might engage in it, but what kind of restrictions you want to put on your own domestic operators. Uh, there are questions about what the right role for industrial policy, how you can incentivize your own local champions, and yet at the same time obey some of those global market practices that you hope your competitors are also tracking with. Um, and then third and finally, how you want to resource this in just terms of bureaucratic structure of your own policy. How do you make this a priority? How do you start thinking about the economics of this as not only a purely economic question, but really something where you see it as national security being an element of it? And I have a lot of questions on these structures, but maybe I will leave it there. Well, thank you, Clara, for this very comprehensive presentation. And yeah, you, you raised a number of questions yourself. So I think we'll get back to this, uh, the issues in the, in the Q&A. By the way, I want to, to remind you that you may ask your question through the Q&A thread, which is at the bottom of your screen. So don't hesitate to ask questions. There are already a couple of them, but don't, don't hesitate to ask your questions um, through this mechanism that I guess you all master now. So uh, now I give the floor to Huang for the Southeast Asian perspective, so, so to speak. So Huang, the yeah, floor is yours. Thank you, Francois. Um, and thank you for my fellow panelists, Alex and Clara, for setting the scene. I agree that um, the technological competition is much more than um, just economic. It is very much political and to a degree also um, ideological, as Alex mentioned. But this is something that Southeast Asia, at least on the diplomatic level, um, tries to reject um, on a broader level of that binary of ideologies that they, this um, like, uh, it, it rejects the narrative coming from the US um, administration about democracy versus uh, autocracy and the use of technology in that. So I'll, I'll explain that in, in, for example, in the Huawei ban, how Southeast Asia um, responded to that. Uh, in general, um, and that was broadly discussed um, at the Shangri-La Dialogue last year, where um, the leaders of Southeast Asia, leaders of the world gathered. And for example, back then, uh, Prime Minister of Malaysia Mahathir back then said that you know Southeast Asia we're open book already there's nothing you don't know about us already and everybody's spying anyway so the the, the concept of security and data security is very different um, Prime Minister of Singapore Lee Hsien Long said that um, you know from technological point of view there's no such thing as 100% of security um, so there is an acceptance of potential risks anyway um, and, and equally in Indonesia, I think there was a, this rejection that we can't be too paranoid about security and security of data or Huawei. Um, similarly, in, in Thailand and Philippines and, and, and Cambodia and Myanmar broadly, they are already testing with Huawei or ZTE. So there is expectation that, you know, um, 
the Chinese technologies will make a huge inroad in Southeast Asia. And I'll explain a little bit why, because it's been a long, um, long-term process that has led to this uh, outcome today. Some of those Southeast Asian, of course, are concerned, and of course, uh, they are more aware. Um, so the level of uh, awareness is also di different across Southeast Asia. So uh, at the moment, we have Vietnam and Singapore that opt not to go with Huawei as a 5G provider or to other Chinese providers, but with European providers, uh, Sony, um, uh, Nokia and um, Ericsson uh, for that matter, both for uh, Vietnam and Singapore. But neither of them have explicitly uh, banned Huawei, right? And even Singapore, who has opted for another provider, European providers of uh, 5G, is still hosting and is willing to host Alibaba and um, other uh, big Chinese companies as a hub in Singapore. So in overall, the picture in Southeast Asia is very mixed and it will remain more mixed. And I think um, as the situation develops and it develops quite fast and COVID certainly is a factor there uh, as well. Uh, I think that the, the disparity in Southeast Asia will remain um, to be seen. For example, it is still a very a region of, you know, a very unequal digital development. The cyber maturity and digital capacity and infrastructure within the region is very unequal. Obviously, we have some of the most advanced like Singapore, but um, the level of cyber maturity in uh, Myanmar, Laos, or Cambodia are, are vastly different. So in a lot of cases, it's not just a matter of political choice, it's also a matter of accessibility and availability and affordability as well. Um, so that uh, so that needs to be um, bear in mind. Another thing, um, again, I, I'll make a point to underline the diversity within the region. It's a vast, big region, a huge population, but it, uh, one common thing is is, is actually very active online and it's going to be become even more active online. It's a young and dynamic population and, and the expectation of, uh, you know, internet users and e-commerce users, e-wallet and very digitally tapped population is very, very high. For example, Th Thailand is one of the highest users of e-commerce in the world um, uh, for that matter. And and I think after COVID, the, the expectation that would be actually surging up with all the e-commerce activities. So um, I'll give you an example. For example, 2019, um, the Southeast Asian e-commerce was accounted around for 38 billion. And um, 2020 is uh, around, 2000, uh, around 62 billion. But it is expected that um, by 2025 is around 170 billion. So it's it's really um, a big fast jump. And uh, allegedly, according to some reports, this year alone during the COVID, uh, Southeast Asia uh, has noted some 40 more million uh, new internet users. So you can you can see how much of the need and demand is is in the region. It is also a region of very um, dynamic. Um, innovation hub. So, uh, for example, Indonesia, Thailand and Vietnam, for that matter, are, are very big and, um, and fastly dynamic developing um, digital uh, and innovation hubs. But um, com coming back to uh, the competition and the great power competition in particular, um, I think the, the picture is very mixed and I think the ideology will be uh, uh, the ideological component or ideological justification whether why not to use or not to use Chinese technology will be um, in a way resisted if not rejected. Um, like I mentioned, it, it, is, a, it, it is a very a, a region that has different political actors. For example, we have two treaty allies of the United States, which are Thailand and, and Philippines, uh, and we have a number of, of um, important security uh, partners such as Singapore and increasingly Vietnam and um, a more uh, neutral elusive um, partners as well. But um, Thailand and Philippines, the two US treaty allies are not likely to join the Huawei ban. And in fact, they are quite likely to support a lot of Chinese technologies and investment in the technological sp space. For, um, for example, uh, um, China invested a lot in the Philippines uh, 
technology as well as camera surveillance technologies that was very supportive for President Duterte's so-called the drug war um, and the campaign of public security and that probably will um, continue to be so even um, during and after COVID. Um, a lot of countries in Southeast Asia uh, have um, ambitions for smart cities. Um, obviously, infrastructure is of huge needs, in, counted by trillions, but the so-called soft infrastructure is also in huge demand. Um, and before the COVID, it was a, a lot of talks about different projects in Thailand, um, in, uh, in Myanmar about the building smart cities, for example, in Mandalay. But also um, I would expect that uh, the Indonesian project of building new capital city would involve a lot of open um, calls for, um, for attenders and uh, allegedly poss possibly a lot of um, Chinese providers as well. So there is a lot of demand, there's a lot of need, and I'm happy to dive into some particular uh, issues um, during Q and A session, we ran out of the time. But to lead up a little bit more background, the Chinese investment in digital sphere in Southeast Asia has been long-standing, um, and it, it dates back be before really that digital Silk Road ambition that is fairly new. But it, um, a lot of Southeast Asian. Uh, observers think that the origin of, of Chinese um, uh, New Silk Road really originated or in a way have been built in the from the experience of investing in Southeast Asia uh, long before this New Silk Road idea uh, came to, to mind. But they've been investing, in, especially in mainland Southeast Asia, in, in roads, infrastructure, um, and pipelines, um, and natural resource extraction. Uh, so, and, and, and um, uh, real estate so it's it's something natural it is spreading from different successful previous cases into bigger and bigger and newer and newer investments for example by one account the deal the china's digital silk road in southeast asia um it was in 2019 our data uh some four billion dollars in malaysia two in two billion in philippines um two in cambodia which is relatively um, smaller and one one billion in Thailand. Obviously, it is very much tied to the political issues. Uh, and also, it depends on the Chinese bilateral relations with those countries or what they want to achieve with that. Um, uh, you don't see uh, that much investment uh, or at least pledged investment investment uh, in Vietnam for the uh, for the for that matter because of the tensions geopolitical tensions especially in the South China Sea um, another thing is uh, we tend to in a broader de debate we tend to focus on on 5g Huawei uh, but there are a lot of other uh, issues that uh, often, are, are left not really um, well uh, researched and, and we're talking about uh, different forms of digital economy. Southeast Asia currently is really fixated on the various um, various you know ways to get out of potentially big economic crisis after the COVID and e-commerce digital uh, economy is one of them. It's, they keep talking about that all the summits and all the meetings and all post COVID recovery plans include um, those issues. Um, and those, those are also um, the hubs that China has had uh, presence for a long, long time, and they're going to keep continuing building on that. Um, I think China recognized the demand and, and even uh, the bigger jump uh, through, uh, after the COVID and will continue to, um, uh, to, to make presence. For example, Alibaba is training uh, a lot of Southeast Asian countries. It provides uh, workshops it, uh, for, uh, you know, innovation um, uh, workshops, investment in, um, in, invites and invest in the hubs, but also uh, announces in um, uh, programs, training programs, and um, um, from the bottom up to really support um, the the um, small businesses and innovation um, in Southeast Asia. Uh, on top of that, South, uh, China also has a so-called China Plus One strategy, where Chinese firms invest money in the local um in the partners local partners of, of individually for example 
it has with uh, a lot of projects with Malaysia on the online delivery platforms and e-commerce with Indonesia. Um, it has a lot of activities across um, a number of countries in Southeast Asia already, and it is uh, China remains in that. Uh, framework as a main supply source um, or customer market for a company, but um, a business that diversifies certain operations to other countries. Um, and it's it's probably um, uh, quite popular and re will remain popular in Southeast Asia. Now, um, I, I know that I'm running uh, against time as well, so um, I'm just going to open up several uh, issues there. But, but by and large, I think um, Southeast Asia have, have been at least on the diplomatic level have been quite vocal and uh, rejecting that um, uh, that kind of binary choice and try in if you notice in there even the outlook of ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific which is another way of responding to uh, great power narratives uh, Southeast Asia says uh, quote reject zero-sum um, co competition and wants to promote cooperation and, and um, you you would uh, probably have heard uh, Southeast Asian leaders saying we don't want to have um, you know either friend A or friend B we want we want to be friends with all of them all both of them but I think uh, uh, beyond that diplomatic narrative they are also quite um, aware of uh, of the challenges of this um, intensifying great power competition and they are also growing aware of that pressure um, and that would change uh, the reality uh, uh, in the market sphere as the supply chain want to, would want to diversify and would want to um, and they are a part of that global uh, supply chain so uh, there's a lot of anxieties and uncertainties um, in Southeast Asia some of them um, actually benefit to to a degree Vietnam has been um, marketed as, um, as some of one of the um, beneficiary of uh, of the trade war uh, and with a lot of factories moving to Vietnam uh, for example but also it is uh, some countries you know if, if they're not depending on um, uh, only a Chinese or or the US um, uh, presence and investment they Japan and Korea are a great, a big um, influencers in, in in the region as well with, with their economic presence. Um, and uh, I only will note on the last point before I wrap up is that uh, that diplomatic pressure has been uh, felt quite um, keenly and quite recently. For example, just in in September and October, where um, both uh, U.S. state uh, said um, Secretary Mike Pompeo um, both attended virtually the meeting but also later made um, visits to some of Southeast Asian countries and in the meetings he, he was urging some of Southeast Asian countries to reconsider their agreements with, with Chinese companies and support U.S. Backlist, blacklist um, uh, decisions, whereas uh, same similarly, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi visited Southeast Asia, some Southeast Asian countries and also asked for support and rejection of that U.S. request. So uh, Southeast Asia is really um, uh, feels that pressure of of being um, uh, of being. Um, facing the great power competition and, and digitally, uh, obviously, digital is one of, uh, of the obvious arena there. I'll stop here. Well, thank you, Wong. Uh, before I open to the, uh, to the discussion, just one tiny question to you, Wong. How come ASEAN didn't do anything as a group on this specific issue? Well, that could be that could have been an opportunity for ASEAN to say something. I mean, to you know, all ASEAN countries to team up together and uh, and take a, a joint position. On Huawei, you mean? Or on... yeah, 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 yeah. Because all, it's all, a all this kind of issues, digital issues, and all this. Yeah, that's the nature of ASEAN. It's not. Um... A supranational body with, you know, one ASEAN foreign policy, just like EU. It is always um, going to be national um, nation state as a member state decision, individual decision. There's a very little level of interoperability among the technology within Southeast Asia. So there's no way ASEAN could come up. First of all, it's by nature. It doesn't have one one. Um, it's rarely have a unified view and on many issues including you know as you know south china sea among others so i wouldn't expect it have would have 
on yeah. um, Huawei. But on another level, like I mentioned, it's a very unequal region with very different um, digital capacity. So there's no way it could have said that because uh, the, the background of each country was also different. Yeah. Well, don't, don't worry, the EU doesn't have a single position <laughs> either. So <laughs> couldn't be expected. Uh, all right. Well, I have a whole bunch of questions. I, I had uh, m myself, so I uh, used the privilege of being the uh, the chair to ask two questions. Uh, well, uh, Alex, to you, well, you, you discussed this techno-nationalism um, concept. And to what extent will this the rise of this techno-nationalism weigh on innovative capabilities? It can be, a, I guess, a hurdle to innovation. Uh, so, how, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, you know, any time that you have uh, decoupling in in the collaborative arena, um, that you you know you lose you lose opportunities, right? And we've even seen that with COVID nineteen and this race to develop a vaccine. We've seen essentially vaccine nationalism uh, playing out, right? So. So I think in that regard, um, it can be um, it can be detrimental. Uh, uh, the flip side of the coin is what I mentioned, and that is if you have a uh, this is this is would be a, a large power, you know, wealthy, affluent nations doubling down and committing, uh, you know, research and development and look and committing to uh, to to collaborate and form public private partnerships. Um, if you look back at the space race. The spillover technologies that spilled over into the commercial sphere, into the medical sphere, were significant, right? Um, you know, many of the technologies that 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 are powering um, our economies today came out of these types of scenarios. So it's you know it it varies by country. Obviously, um, you know, Huang mentioned, you know, we have very uneven levels of development uh, and economic maturity in a place like Southeast Asia. So a country like Singapore um, is going to benefit significantly from a lot of the spillover um, effects of techno-nationalism as companies look to invest in Singapore as an R&D center, as they look to leverage the critical mass that's already here in Singapore. Some companies will actually relocate. Um, there'll be more activity in the semiconductor sector um, you know, a lot, you know, biotech, clean tech, uh, things, things of that nature. I think the, 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 the geopolitical scenario, COVID, has actually become a catalyst for, um, you know, climate change, uh, you know, heading off climate change, be, you know, preempting climate change, that type of thing. So, again, it will, I think it's going to be very, very different from country to country. Okay, thank you. And one, one question to you, uh, Clara, with a question that you actually raised your, yourself about S South Korea, you know, the ability or the validity of the of the stance taken by South Korea, which is kind of sitting between two two chairs. You know, how, how do you do you do you think this is a, well, a viable uh, position? It certainly had a, an amount of viability in the short term. I do question the long term viability of it, because essentially what it's hoping for is that you can effectively wait out the Trump administration or wait out U.S. public policy in general, that there will be an emphasis on either making a decision between the two or just making a decision differently. Um, in terms of the viability of the actual security question, let's even you know take the U.S. outside of it. Is this a good protective measure? Um, I, you know, I am not a programmer myself, so you know I've met with a number of programmers and other engineers who work on 5G architecture in particular, and they have talked to me about you know the quantum encryption methods and all the things and why this is different. Um, but at the end of the day. You know, if my commercial network gets hacked because it's not as secure as it could be, um, you know, maybe that's not the same as a national security secret, but it certainly is a reputational concern, both for me and also, you know, if I'm sitting in a seat in Seoul trying to correct, uh, collect or 
trying to convince other companies that they should reshore to my country because, you know, we're very secure, we're very good at managing data, we have all the conditions you want in place. So I think longer term, it definitely is a risk. So it's, a, it's some kind of an illusion to think that you can uh, disconnect the, the two, the commercial aspect and, and really the more sensitive part of the network. It's an illusion to think that you can you know, separate the two. Of, that. Yeah. You know. Alex, you want to add something on this specific point? Well, yeah, and, and let me try and tie that into the economic side of things. Um, you know, why are, why are developing countries so keen to buy Huawei kit and technology? Um, well, because it's, it's, it's a lot less expensive, right? And so, so the, the economic side of techno-nationalism is going to become more and more pronounced. And why is, why is Huawei equipment so much less expensive than buying Nokia or Ericsson? Because of the, uh, because of the mercantilist um, system in China, right? The very heavy subsidies, huge amounts, you know, cheap credit, um, grants, matching loans, all kinds of things that state-owned banks or state-backed financial institutions in China uh, throw into the equation along the digital belt and road, whether it's in Southeast Asia or anywhere else, uh, for governments to, 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 you know, to buy that equipment. Now, here's the question. If there were more players in that space, if there were more players other than Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, uh, now maybe Samsung might be coming on in, in, in a bit, you know, getting into that market. Um, if there truly was, there was competitive pricing in that space, and now there's going to be, because again, from in a mercantilist sense, the United States and the Europeans are now putting up money, essentially, to counter any any uh, deals that Huawei would 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 uh, you know would would put out there, so we're going to start seeing uh, parity on price. So I think from a Southeast Asian uh, perspective, um, you know what do countries want? They want to develop fast. They want to have access to that that technology. They want it inexpensive, but then they don't want to be in a situation to have a binary choice. So it would be great to see a market that had multiple uh, multiple players and that's where I think we're going that's part of the techno nationalist push that we're seeing from the Europeans and, and otherwise is a they're gonna they're gonna they're going to spread this process out as countries wait um, to you know and and um, that's almost a de facto sort of pushing Huawei out and remember the other thing is is that again from a techno nationalist standpoint, Huawei will be unable to build or even service its 5G infrastructure once it burns through its stockpile of, of chips that, you know, you know again, uh, chips that, you know, technology that, that it, high silicon and others don't have in China to produce. So once that happens, if, you know, from a techno-nationalist standpoint, if you have these other countries pushing to develop, you know, alternatives to Huawei, at some point, there will be more choices and options in the market. Um, and, and so Singapore, I think, I don't want to take too long on this question, but Singapore, I think, was really, really, um, really clever the way they, they went about this. They said, look, but Singapore is a very sophisticated, mature economy. Uh, but they said, look, we're going to have multiple people build our 5G network. But we're also going to make, um, we're going to make sure that we have an entire ecosystem of small, you know, mid-sized tech companies that are also going to be part of this ecosystem. And we're going to come up with our own specs for our 5G around security. We're going to build in, we're going to, we're going to make bespoke security solutions and so forth and so on. And finally, the other thing I think that will change the 5G market over the next five years is this idea of open sourcing, right? This idea of open sourcing the standards in the 5G space so that no single company or no you know triage of big companies are going to have that monopoly power to where they're making end-to-end -end equipment but you know again if you open up standards if you open source and governments fund that which they are then we'll see many more players enter that space uh, we'll have a much healthier uh, sort of a market and and the product will be better too 
you know, you're an economist, Francois. You know, there are there are experts that say that that um, you know the best innovation in 5G is coming from Nokia and Ericsson and Samsung, but they just don't have the massive scale to push out other players in the market because they're not getting the same kind of um, uh, mercantilist support. So I think all of this will play out. That would be the return of economics. <laughs> That's good. Okay, well, I have plenty of questions. But... Uh, well, can I jump on that quickly, just about sure. Um, sure. the Huawei? I think what, one important point is also to make is that Huawei has been in Southeast Asia in particular for a long, long time. So it's, it's uh, you know, two decades, and it's been there for infrastructure for previous 4G, 3G, whatnot, and also others, uh, other issues, uh, other stuff. So it's not, um, it's it's about accessibility and affordability and availability as well. So when the US comes and says, you know, ban Huawei, then the question is, what are the other alternatives that are available or accessible and affordable for those countries, while they already had been using Huawei provided 3G or, or 4G for that matter. And even, you know, in, in Australia, who was one of the first countries to, to um, really ban Huawei, it, it went with, uh, with Huawei for earlier uh, 4Gs and uh, 3G. So it must be, to, to a degree, this is a very political decision and, and blacklisting and, and banning, it's not very, um, it's not very organic and, innov um, uh, and innovation friendly approach. So uh, I think one advantage that China has over uh, US is that it understands that despite this big and very unevil region, Southeast Asia is a very attractive region, attractive market for, for 5, 5G and, and other internet economies. It's, it's you know, only um, uh, 80 million uh, potential 5G service subscribers and you know, a, a market of 1.2 trillion um, uh, US dollars in Southeast Asia. And that's the estimation before COVID, before ever, we have new internet users. So I think US also have to uh, understand the the um, you know, attractiveness of this market. So th yeah, thank you. Uh, so a, a couple of questions about uh, well, precisely what? Well, let's stick to to Huawei perhaps for a, for a minute. Uh, so the first thing is about Bi uh, Biden's uh, position on this. What, what do you think could be the uh, U.S. approach uh, on Huawei under this new administration? That's one one first thing on Huawei. And otherwise, uh, are, are there um, other pressure on Northeast Asian or in Southeast Asian uh, regarding Huawei? Uh, do, have, we, have we seen other pressure on these governments um, on uh, Huawei? And finally, uh, pop, pop, pop. No, that, that's, that's it on, on Huawei. This, these two small questions, and then we'll, we'll uh, take more complex questions. So yeah, Alex, do you have an idea about Biden's position yeah. on this? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think what's coming out uh, was sort of been uh, seeping out uh, from the the Biden uh, camp is that um, they might reconsider um, on the Huawei issue. They might reconsider uh, uh, on the peripheral uh, technology, the so-called non-core uh, technology of networks, where you know it, it would make sense. I mean, re remember that Huawei uh, built networks in the United States. Right, um, you know, in, in in rural parts of the United States, again, because they they were a lot less expensive, uh, and and so so I think in that regard, you know, that we might see that happen. Uh, but I think the overall trajectory, um, when it comes to techno nationalism and when it comes to Huawei in particular, uh, will not change uh, under the Biden administration. And the pressures exerted on various governments in uh, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia about this Huawei issue, uh, Clara? Yeah, actually, and could I comment quickly on the Biden administration question as well? Uh, because I would agree with Alex that it is going to be less of a breaking point than I think China or even some of our allies and partners such as Korea might want or think appropriate. and that 
is in part due to how the overall conversation in the United States has shifted as well on China in the last several years, uh, but also because US policy is not just the executive branch as well, right? Like there is a strong role for the US Congress in this, and some of the more aggressive actions that you've seen you can actually date back to pre-2016, you know, looking at the Defense of Trade Secrets Acts, other efforts to push back on what was seen as unfair Chinese mercantilistic practices. And those trends, I think, still continue to have weight. Um, I think that weighs directly on the question of both what are some of the overt pressures that we've seen, as well as will those continue you know, after January 21st of next year. Um, I would argue that it's been both a pressure campaign, but also an effort to create a positive alternative vision as well. So, you know, certainly U.S. Embassy Seoul has been very direct in their engagement with South Korea, for example, and counterparts in the Moon administration about their feelings on Huawei. Uh, but some of the more extreme suggestions of what might that might translate into, you know, would we cut South Korea off from intelligence sharing or more dramatically, you know, break in our exchanges or allowing those imports to happen in the high tech sector. Those sort of things hasn't happened. We've seen much more movement on some of the like positive norms creation efforts. I think the clean network you could describe as one of those, even though it has its own problems, uh, as being an effort to say not just we want to block Huawei, but what does the system that we want enforced actually look like and how can others join and compete in that space? Yeah, so th thank you. Well, one, one question, I guess, again to, to Alex. Well, the debate on TikTok in the US uh, illustrated the dilemma to disentangle uh, commercial interests, privacy, and national security co concerns. And are there lessons that can be learned for Southeast Asia, especially in relations to the choice or ban of apps? Uh, that is a great question. You know, I'm just now sort of doing a forensic analysis of this whole TikTok uh, event in the United States. Particularly, I'm particularly looking at this attempt for of um, Oracle and, and Walmart uh, to buy uh, TikTok from ByteDance. And I, I got to tell you, um, I, I think, I mean, I guess there's two levels to that question. The first is, um, you know, to what extent does it make sense to ban an app in a particular country, a Chinese app, for example, like WeChat or TikTok, because the parent company is Chinese and under Chinese law, all Chinese companies are required to turn over data or do whatever the government asks them under the you know, Cybersecurity Act and the national security law. Hence, no data is safe, et cetera, et cetera. So there's that. Hypothetically, uh, any Chinese company then is a proxy of the Chinese state. And this is an existential crisis for Chinese companies. Uh, and you know, when even looking at ByteDance, they're opening a huge data center here in Singapore. Um, you know, you've got Tencent and the other big companies doing the same. Um, hypothetically, you cannot separate a Chinese tech company from the Chinese state because of the way the law is structured and the way that the Chinese government is doubling down now on the influence that they're exerting on not just the big tech companies, but even the smaller companies in the tech sector. So that that is... Um, that's an existential crisis for Chinese companies. Now, the question then becomes, in a situation like TikTok, can you have um, a Chinese-owned company be partially owned by non-Chinese, uh, you know, by Americans or European companies or whatever? Um, and then the problem that, that, that's, that's surfaced with TikTok is you have who controls the algorithms and the AI, ByteDance doesn't want to give up that, uh, they don't want to give up the algorithms and the AI, and the Chinese government has just put those algorithms on an export control list, right? And so the Chinese government is not going to authorize, um, you know, what they consider to be uh, strategic, uh, strategic AI. Now, this is, bear in mind that this is an algorithm that serves up video recommendations to teenagers, okay? Um, so I, you know, I think, I think in that regard, um, we are going to see a bifurcation 
of the technology sector when it comes to the big Chinese technology companies. I don't think there's any way around that. I mean, I and when I speak to all of the bigger, um, you know, all of the big American companies, um, you ask the question, you know, would you do a joint venture with a Chinese, would you do a joint venture with Tencent or Alibaba? I mean, they look at you like you're crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen. So, you know, I think we're going to see more of this um, and we'll just see a very clear sort of point of demarcation, even in Southeast Asia, when you look at this huge untapped market of, you know, digital, uh, of mobile first consumers, um, it's going to become a very competitive uh, market and you will see the Chi you'll see Chinese companies competing with non-Chinese companies in this space um, with very different ecosystems. Yeah, thank, thank you for this very complete <laughs> uh, response. Well, uh, perhaps to connect that to uh, very recent uh, events, how would you, do you see the, um, the impact of te techno-nationalism? What does techno-nationalism mean for the development and the uh, good functioning of big uh, free trade areas or free trade agreements like uh, CPTPP or uh, RCEP? Do you, do you see any impact on this? Would, would that hinder the development of these global trade arrangements, multilateral trade arrangements rather? Anybody on that? I'll defer to uh, Huang or Clara on that one. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Unfortunately, I don't have um, answer to that, or no, I don't have sufficient information. And I, I know everybody is very excited about the RCEP that was just signed last week. But um, and at the same time, you know, um, support for trade, support for uh, trade liberalization and continuous. Uh, integration of uh, both Southeast Asia and East Asia in that for that matter and, and to, to some degree also um, uh, further down here to the Pacific of New Zealand and, and um, Australia but um, I didn't get the information about the the, the techno part okay. of the, the, the trade so it's a very interesting thing to uh, to observe and you know they, they, it's still time for countries to ratify so I think this Will still uh, evolve for some time. But my two cents on that, I, uh, my, my impression is that a number of uh, uh, sectors or pro products are excluded, and though and particular products that are maybe connected to very sensitive uh, yeah. activities. So that may be the uh, the response uh, to, <laughs> to that. I mean, if we have time, uh, Francois, maybe we can come back to that. Uh, there, there are probably other questions, but um, I mean, I would just say very quickly. Um, multilateral frameworks such as the RCEP or I think more specifically the CPTPP um, are I think ideal carve outs for frameworks around digital trade if they can if they can be implemented um, and you know so rules around e-commerce e-identification numbers dispute uh, resolution mechanisms you know digital cash um, uh, you know standards and so forth and so on I think I think uh, uh, multilateral uh, trade agreements are very, very important. But what we are seeing across Southeast Asia and across Asia and, and the world is we're seeing either um, very, very specific carve outs being um, put in uh, around those areas that I just mentioned. The question is, will they be enforced in a region where you have very, very different levels of development and different levels of expectations this is the issue that we have with the RCEP. Um, even with the CPTPP, when the United States withdrew from the agreement, 20 provisions were essentially put on hold. And guess what? Most of those provisions were around IP protection, around digital trade, around all of these things. Um, that countries like Vietnam, in particular, um, you know, weren't particularly thrilled to keep doing if they didn't have access to the U.S. market, right? So. Um, I think so between multilateral arrangements, bilateral arrangements between countries where they actually put in a specific uh, air, you know, framework around digital trade, I think we'll probably see more of that or we'll see digital only uh, 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 arrangements emerging from countries like Japan, Singapore, Australia, et cetera, 
um, you know, we're, we're seeing some of those already. So, um, but clearly ASEAN is really struggling and, and has been uh, with, you know, unified, harmonized rules around all these non-tariff measures that have been in place. This is the story of ASEAN now for decades, yeah. um, which continues to be the, the, the struggle. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, Clara, do you want to add something on the, on this? Uh, yeah, or maybe. Anything else? Yeah, what time, I'm, time is I'm finding myself nodding along a lot with Alex that, you know, as we've seen with RCEP and the CPTPP, progress marches on even despite some of these issues, some of these tensions, but perhaps at a slower pace and a lower level of ambition than say we, the United States might like to see. Um, you know, in addition to the carve outs, I, I would underscore the same point, don't count out bilaterals and mini laterals. We've already seen a number of cases uh, in the renegotiation of the USMCA in the United States, uh, in Japan's cooperation with the EU as well, to think about setting these kind of sub-regional or mini regional standards that can then bubble up to greater global norms and hopefully influence that conversation. I think the anxiety that some of us here on this panel might have is, you know, didn't we already reach that stage? Is it, you know, two steps forward, but, you know, two and a half steps back, you know, where are we, how do we actually positively move the ball on this? Okay, before, before we close, perhaps one, very last question, and this is again to, I, I guess, to Lajis and to, to you, Clara. Well, uh, since J Japan's uh, South Korea, Taiwan are very highly dependent on, on China, economically speaking. So how would they react to an alliance of democracies to contain uh, the PRC? I saw this question in the chat too, and I was thinking about this. I want to take the word democracy out of it for just a second and then I'll break it back in because arguably this idea of the, an alliance that might be used to contain the PRC is exactly the criticism that got thrown at the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the response that we saw, I'd say, from Korea was to say, we're really not going to join in the system, even if we agree with the principles, if it is an either or. Uh, Japan, however, said, no, no, you know, this is, you know, about constraining the bad practices. So we're happy to have it be a framework that China could join if it meets these standards. Uh, and that's, you know, essentially how I would anticipate it playing out in some version or another. Uh, bring back, back in. I think I'd only caution that it sounds like it's a easier, closer, uh, more like-minded set of groups, but especially on some of the forward-looking data protection, data privacy question, there are a lot of really complicated debates just even in the Asia Pacific on law enforcement access to data, other questions about what should be allowed in cross-border flows. Yeah, and I'm afraid we don't all agree on the on this uh, on these issues. You know, across the, the Atlantic, for instance, we're not on the same page, as far as I know, in the US and in, in Europe. So that's that's really tricky. If ever somebody wants to add something, this is really the last call because we are our well, time is up, so we're running out of time. If you want to add something before we we conclude, up to, up to you, Alex. You want to add something? Otherwise, that's the end of it. No, everybody's happy with that. All right. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. That was great. And thanks for the uh, the audience uh, who stayed put during the whole the whole exercise. So thanks to to all of you. And I hope to see you in person in Paris at some point. Unfortunately, for the time being, we are through on videos. Sorry for that. So bye bye. Have a nice day. Uh, good night to you, Hong. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, good to see everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.